This paper is part of my larger project on volume with respect to projection practices and kinetic art from the 20s to the 60s. I focus on volume in order to reflect critically on the lineage of multi-projections and their sculptural identification. In this presentation, I will look at contemporary artist Rosa Barba's recent media ensemble in 2012 in the Museum of Photography, Jeux de in Paris, First, through the lens of its historical precedents, Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's Theories of Volume and Space in 1929. And secondly, alongside uh, Francis Picabia's production, Rolage, in 1924. Through these examples, my paper draws attention to recurring topoi of projection experiments in theater architecture that consciously interrupt the spatio-temporal conventions of the movie theater and point to the conception of cinema as a process exceeding its constitutive elements. Volume has been neglected in the art historical discourse, which has often equated it to that of an object or sculpture, as well as in the theory of cinema, where it is totalized as that which is represented on the two-dimensional screen. This paper directs attention to volume as an a-quantifiable entity and probes its qualitative aspect in the projection practices. Projected light, rather than serving as a mere career of the image, acts as a sculpture or object itself, as in Anthony McCall's Solid Light Films or Michel Verjeux's, oops, Michel Verjeux's Light Sculptures. Light sculpts space and focus reorients towards intangible properties, opening up a cinematic work in terms of its processes and, effect, and, effect, and effect. I interpret this volume as exceeding itself, first, as light that it literally bleeds into the space of projection, and secondly, as a constantly permitting space to be inhabited and performed by spectators through their memory and physical presence within projection installation. As a context, I would like to introduce instances of volume within the lineage of avant-garde or so-called expanded cinema practices that have been merely thought of as minor remarks to their environmental use of light. Oh. In 1929, Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, artist and theorist in the Bauhaus School, envisions virtual volume through kinetic sculptures and light projection. He describes the addition of time to the three-dimensional mass that results in motion. Motion secures a sensation of virtual volume by leading the viewer to disintegrate the form. In 1970, 1970 in an interview with Jin Youngblood, Filmmaker Francis Thompson proposes a theater with an area of projection that defies the spatial limits and flat surface of the screen. This theater itself would be a huge sphere of infinite volume. Nearly four decades apart, both Moholy and Thompson envision a kind of cinematic space that verges on the sculptural, where sculpture takes on the properties of space. For the purpose of this paper, I focus on the concept of volume that surfaces in the 20s in accordance with art historian Rosalind Krauss's observation that an idea about volume conditioned constructivist art at the time. As Moholy clarifies and as understood in the art historical discourse, sculpture is distinct from architecture in that the sculpture is volume creation while the architecture is space creation. While virtual volume seems to indicate volume's liberation from mass and expansion into the spatial, Moholy argues that sculpture is always a closed hole, even with, within the virtual contours of kinetic sculpture. Although Moholy's binary understanding of the relation between volume and space remains rigid, his thinking of the material itself is fluid. He conceives of mass as a combination of volume relationships. This formula is materialized a decade earlier in sculptures by Georges Van Tongolo, a founding member of the group Distai with Theo van Duisburg in 1918, as reflected in the title of his works, Interrelation of Volumes. This paper remains close to Moholy's fluid formula of sculpture, composition of volume relationships. In 2012, Rosa Barba assembled three audiovisual objects in the museum's movie theater as part of her exhibition, Vue de la Porte du Fond, Backdoor Exposure. The discussion of volume in this installation begins with the artist's conception of the movie theater as, quote, a kind of a sculpture, end quote. In this theater, first was the Hidden Conference of Fractured Play, a 35 millimeter film on deserted Roman sculptures in a museum storage area that you see in the far back. Second was a sound work, equal, equal sonic contribution to a distributed place that accompanied the film intermittently, 
Complimenting this oral piece was an illuminated, oversized gramophone speaker in the middle of the seats that did not produce any sound. Lastly, stating the real sublime, a two-part projection piece completed the ensemble. Touching the very audience seat and bleeding in onto the black back wall was a wide frame of light that oscillated between a geometric rectangle and an anamorphic flash. The projector was exposed through an illuminated circle around it, conflicting with the film on the screen to its left. Through the concept of what I propose as performative volume, my analysis departs from Moholy's idea of virtual volume. The fluctuation of light and bodies in Barba's installation refuses the strict binaries between volume and space that Moholy advances. By extrapolating volume relations further, this paper elucidates volume, specifically a performative one that is marked by changeability and reactivity in an extra quantitative sense. Volume designates the amount of mass on the one hand and the magnitude of performance on the other. Here, one must note that volume has its etymological origins in the Latin word volumen, which derives from the word verb ververe, which means to turn around, to roll. The quality of curvature and movement is inherent in the definition of volume as scrolls or a roll of parchment, or rouleau in French. And it is not a mere coincidence that the scroll, the perfect embodiment of volume, motion, and change, is incorporated in filmmaker Hans Richter's study of rhythm and animation. Richter, Mother, Moholy's contemporary who worked closely with Dada and other Bauhaus artists, used scrolls as a site of drawing and experiment, susceptible to modifications, as you see here, rouleau, rhythmic, and rythme van trois. Uh, The scroll, or volume, becomes the very site where rhythmic changes take place. When displayed, the scroll demands a haptic reading that involves a movement of the eye across the horizontal axis of light, sight. Volume's definition thus positions it as the embodiment of change of magnitude and flux. The historical lineage of projection cannot be reviewed without the generative archive of the definitions of volume. In Barba's ensemble, the performative volume of object overflows the contours defined by material and proliferates outside, of it, outside its original structure or meaning. First, the projector is displayed outside the projection room held by the celluloid. This film strip mimics the hand of the projectionist since the cinematic turn of the 19th century. Like the physiological engagement and labor of the projectionist that scholar Lisa Cartwright details, the celluloid both sustains the weight of the projector and determines its process of projection. The setup is counterintuitive. The process and aberrant act of projection are privileged over its instruments. The increasingly vulnerable and unstable condition of the celluloid in suspension, as well as the projected luminous frame, indexes the motion behind projection. Secondly, the lit gramophone's singular and estranging presence contrasts with the, the spare presence of the spectator. Normally a space of absorption, the theater seat becomes an unapproachable site. Devoid of function, the gramophone <coughs> imposes a volume that is not sonic, but rather performative. All the more perplexing as volume describes the intensity of sound, it indicates units of decibels or the magnitude of currents that give rise to them. The performative volume of the gramophone bears a repelling effect on the spectator, underlining the very definition of relation. Relation differentiates and unlinks singular elements while assuming their connection and association. In a formal sense, the movie theater is a closed space. It is a sphere of volume, a sphere of conventions delimited by an architectural frame. Through the interplay of volume relationships, wherein each constituent performs out of, outside of its own field of reference, the theater trespasses the threshold of volume space binaries. Barbara's movie theater approached the no notion of the whole that Gilles Deleuze evokes in his cinema on l'image mouvement. He writes, unquote, in inseparable from the open, relations do not belong to objects, but to the whole, which is not a closed set. By move on in space, the objects of a set change their respective positions. It is through relations that the whole is, is transformed or changes qualitatively." End quote. On the one hand, Barba's theater space is deployed to organize matter in a set. On the other, mobile sections, each performing volume of bodies and lights, constitute distinct holes in time. Complementing these sculptural models is the film A Hidden Conference of Fractured Play, 
has signaled in the title the concept of fracture recurs in the film in the forms of a rapid succession of static shots, light flare, and broken dialogues, as well as in subject matter, Roman sculptures with missing body parts. This fracture further characterizes this junction between the filmic realism and the surrounding imageless projections in the theater. The film's tour around fractured sculptures through a museum's archive reflects and informs the Aaron itinerary in Barba's light ensemble. It rehearses and repeats the disappearance of the object that always longs to be remembered as Peggy Phelan notes on the ontology of performance. Moreover, Barba compares her projection to, quote, making a drawing to an audience. Nonetheless, to draw light is precisely what a drawing of line cannot do. Rather, it is the aesthetic function of color to convey the light that makes it visible. In this sense, drawing loses or cancels itself, like vision annihilated by blindness at the limit of its own access. Thus, the self-canceling horror, as suggested in the title, Rolage, uh, as translated as canceled performance, figures on the level of the spectator as well as the activity of spectacle itself. It is at this precise limit, the threshold of their insufficiency, where forms open onto other forms. The blind field, the limit of vision, becomes the site of oblivion that opens onto the volume of imagination. Barba's project projection on the audience, like Picabia's light assault, is not unlike the documenting camera's relentless flash onto the performing subject, an effort to preserve bodies now absent. The fleeting performance of light is the site of, quote, the staging of an appearance as disappearance, unquote, the flash that Hulong Bakht sees as a moment of longing and pleasure. Therefore, I argue that the simultaneity of construction and cancellation, drawing and blinding, spectacle and oblivion delineates performative volume. Volume self effaces and is activated through the relationships between bodies and light. Punctuated by blindness, Barba's theater is in a perpetual state of suspension. It performs an intermission like Claire's film Entracte within Relâche. The entire ensemble of light play propositions the spectator in a perpetual suspension of indetermination and selection. To conclude, I argue that there is volume questioning the re-evocation of the movie theater as an object itself, as artists Johnny Cardiff and George Burris Miller similarly do. The spectator is invited to ascend into their fabricated, fabricated miniature theater or sculpture and examine the very acts of, or rituals of spectating. As the screen presents a view of another screening room through a forced illusion of depth, what the spectator sees is a mirror image of herself, her per persistent relation to and location in theater architecture. In Barbara's theater, the presence and movement of the spectator's bodies are initiated unawares to participate in the volume relations. Evoking the formula of the kinetic sculpture of the 20s, the volume of her light ensemble as a whole is constantly created and is in flux sustained and organized through the viewer's motion and her, own very, very, and her very own perceptual grasp of the changing relations between bodies and space. Within this complex topography of relations between volume and space, a persistent, unresolved desire for deviation surfaces. In his 1975 essay, Living the Movie Theater, Roland Bach contemplates on cinematographic hypnosis. He, remark, he remarks that one, quote, must be in the story, but one must also be elsewhere, a slightly disengaged image repertoire, end quote. The very method of escaping hypnosis is not only to be armed by the discourse of counter ideology and cinematic apparatus, but also by letting oneself to be fascinated twice over by the image and by its surroundings within the movie theater, or what I argue is the topography of volume relationships. Rather than adopting the nostalgic voice that narrates the discourse of ruins, museums, and film, I consider movie theater as a generative archive. I mean an amorous distance within the movie theater precisely for its expansive possibility through fluctuating volume relationships. Barba's recent instance reflects on the very productive means by which we engage moving images today, particularly within a space of conventions. In 2012, when I entered the cool and dim theater in the museum's basement, amid the disparate ruptures of conventions, I did not know where to place myself. Puzzled and contemplative, I had exited the purely somatic volume of myself by projecting my imaginations onto the space of the theater.
my body having become an object like the other sculptures, rather than a simply beholding subject, joined the volume relations of Barba's light ensemble. The totality of volume in her theater was not limited to the mass of its constitutive objects, but expanded to encompass the spectator's subjectivity. It was through this constant dialogue among volume relations where the sculptural objects and I were suspended in a state of incomplete utterances, fragmented conventions, that the boundary between volume and space was overcome. The red glow of the walls in Barbara's theater haunts me. Today in the movie theater, in its darkness, I can be fully immersed in the pleasure of voyeurism, watching not the eroticized bodies enlarged on the screen, but those fellow spectators whose ennui, distraction, or disinterest in the dominant screen makes their minds leap beyond their bodily limits. I watched the bodies of light reflected on the walls of the theater, the color gradients abstracted from filmic realism, the very expansion of material volumes into imagination, the immeasurable area of projection. Thank you. Thank you.